Welcome to another episode of the Information Addicts Podcast. My name is Cassidy. I'm an information addict, and this is my podcast where I explore information, ideas, and beliefs and try to do those things more responsibly. Today, I have a conversation with my friend Luke. I met Luke on the Discord, and I know I've had a lot of Discord friends on lately, but what can I say? They're great conversationalists, and I love being able to take the things that we're talking about there and bring it on to what I'm doing here. So uh, that's what I did. Uh, Luke actually, uh, a couple weeks back, was talking about one of his favorite musicians and some of the struggles he was having with uh, his wife and how that was sort of being played out in the public sphere. And it got me starting to think about celebrities and, you know, how prominent people's actions and beliefs change the way we look at their own works and our own beliefs. And I wanted to talk about that with him. I thought the conversation was lovely, and I hope you guys enjoy it too. All right, Luke. Welcome to the podcast. Yay. So so glad to have you. Nice. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you because if nothing else, it's an excuse just to chat. Yeah. So before we get in, let's just have you do a brief introduction for people who don't know you, and then we can jump into our topic. Okay. Um, so I met Cassidy virtually. Um, unfortunately, we haven't met in real life yet. We will, though. Um, I think we met, we knew each other, bef- did we know each other before Bridges of Meaning? No, I, I mean, I think, I think I saw your videos on Paul's channel before I got on the Discord, but that's, that's how mm-hmm. we would have met. Okay, I can't, I, I, I'm, my sense of time is terrible, so that's the first thing everyone should know about me. No, no, <laughs> um, so, yeah. We know each other through the kind of bridges of meaning, Paul Vanderclay community. Um, my sense of time in relation to that is very fuzzy because I've known some people from before that um, through, I guess, the YouTube comments. I don't know. Mm. Uh, and some people I knew even prior to that through Twitter and stuff, but all these online friendships. And, um, and so I guess that that's kind of how we met. And that's all related to, I don't know, Paul is the, he was a uh, overtly self-identifying Christian pastor commenting on Jordan Peterson. And so I like to describe the community as a group of people who it's like there was this bat signal sent out to the world. It's really international <laughs> of just all the kinds of weirdos that like all the kind of people that in my real life that I always want to talk to about stuff and that I send content and YouTube videos and just try forever to get them excited about the stuff that I'm excited about. And we'll even Sarah and I, Sarah Hardy and I have talked about this, how we would send people videos and we, and we're like, we know it's overwhelming. I know I send you a lot of stuff. <laughs> this is just the timestamp. Just watch these two minutes. And we just, so like all those people from all over the world, it just, kind of coalesce them into this one small community that's just pretty much like crack for anyone yeah. who's in the community. So it's just a bunch of nerds and people that are highly excitable. The, the um, and you, you coined the term, the randos. So mm-hmm. it's all of us. Paul calls us bridgers now, whatever. We're just, it's like a little not non-cult cult. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's all the crazy people in your life who like, yeah, exactly, who like flood you with videos. All of a sudden we found each other and now we're all drowning and we're like, I can't keep up. We've never said that in our lives, but then we get all this community like, I can't keep up on all the media. <laughs> that's No, that's exactly true because I was always the person in my real life who was just like, just a content hog and just watching and doing and sharing. And now we're all making content too, like this. And we're just sharing it more with each other. And everyone's just like, I can't. Uh, it's yeah. a problem. It is. Which, you know, is my whole channel, right? <laughs> more. This is the, I'd also like to say that my one goal for this is I just want to get more views than Andrew with the bangs. Bangs. <laughs> we'll see. She's at like uh, 80 right now. So who uh, knows? I haven't, I don't think she shared it on her platforms yet, but. Awesome. Well, send it to her I'll send ours to her that she should tweet (laughs) perfect sounds good well thanks Luke um yeah it's been lovely to get to know you I'm pretty sure Bridges of Meaning was where we started because I'm pretty much 
not on other social media platforms at all. So that's probably <laughs> our first encounter, but it's been fun to get to know you. Yes. So I'll jump into sort of like a jumping point for the conversation. Again, we can go wherever we want to with it, but a couple of weeks ago you were on the Discord and you showed a music video and wanted to talk about um, a specific singer and sort of his journey and your perceptions of that. So why don't you kind of give a little bit of background on that and then we can have a back and forth about that and see where it goes. <clears throat> cool. Um, yeah, so that, that started because I was talking to Shelly um, about relational stuff and um and it made me think of this derek webb is a well i don't even know what you'd call him now uh for the longest time he was a christian musician in the kind of ccm christian contemporary music scene and uh and i loved him he was uh i, I mean i still do i just don't follow him as much anymore but he was in the band caveman's call for a long time he started being, he was a professional musician. He started like when he was 17. So he's been doing that his whole life. He, I don't know, like 40 ish now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've always just really loved his music and more than anything, just really loved uh, what he had to say through his music and a lot of stuff that he would say at concerts and things. I've just always been a big fan of him. <clears throat> and um, he has kind of gone through an interesting journey. So I don't know. I, I, I said probably until recent years, he was like in my top five most influential people outside of my real life, which is a mm -hmm. big thing. Um, that's probably changed now because I've come across some heavyweights in the last few years. But, um, but he, uh, so probably now, I don't know, three years ago or something, he put out this album called I Was Wrong, I'm Sorry and I Love You. <clears throat> Excuse all my clearing of the throat too. <laughs> You're fine. Um, I've realized I do it all the time. I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just like obnoxious. And I saw some comment once in a YouTube video that was just like, tell him to stop clearing his throat. <laughs> um, so I'm conscious of it. I'm aware. Critics. Um, so he, so he put out this album. I was wrong. I'm sorry. And I love you. And, um, it just had some, I mean, it has some really great songs on it. Um, but one of the songs in particular is this song called The Vow, um, where he does a little intro into it, talking about um, his faith and <clears throat> making commitments, making vows, how he likes to paint himself into a corner and basically give himself. It's, it's interesting because it's like basically giving himself no freedom almost like he likes to paint himself into a corner is one is the lyric and um and so it's related to his faith it's related to his marriage it was related to all these things but then what what i found out really interestingly like in a, the months that followed the um the release of that album i found out that he was uh going through a divorce and that he and that was due to infidelity on his part and um and it was weird it was kind of the first that was probably like the first it's not even that high profile because he's not like a huge musician but he was mm -hmm. really in my life and his wife his former wife his ex-wife is sandra mccracken who is also um, a huge influence that i'm a big fan of um and i was just i was really shell-shocked it was almost surprising to me for how affected i was by it by people i didn't really know mm -hmm. and um and it was just so, I found the whole thing so crazy. Cause like he's writing this album called I was wrong. I'm sorry. And I love you. And there's all these songs on it, but particularly this one about the vow. And, and he had to be writing the album like while he was being unfaithful to his wife. And I was just like, what is going on? Like, how does that even, how does that even happen? Mm -hmm. um, and so since then, uh, it's been really interesting because I had I have a lot of respect for Derek Webb, even intellectually I had um, and for his faith and the way he thought of his faith. And since then, he's kind of gone through um, a deconstruction, I guess. Uh, and now, I mean, at least last I checked, he did not. I think he no longer identifies as Christian, um, which is interesting. And that's like a <clears throat> you hear of that thing a lot, but. Um, and that's something that we talk about a lot in Bridges of Meaning. Paul talks about Rhett and Link, um, mm -hmm. Joshua Harris, who came out of the Sama Grace church tradition, which of which was 
like the most significant probably Christian tradition of uh, my life prior to uh, moving toward orthodoxy. Um, and, it, and it's just so interesting because like these guys, Joshua Harris in particular, it's really easy to just automatically discredit these guys and just be like, ah, um, you know, they're fickle and they're using this as a justification or whatever kind of rationalizations you want to have for why these people do it. But like these guys, I still largely respect them. And like, even we talked about the Joshua Harris thing. Like I loved, I don't know, some people don't like him. I still like him a lot and think he's a really earnest guy. And I liked that documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, and Derek Webb, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about Derek Webb now, but it's just, I find all of that fascinating. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't know exactly where you want to take it from there, but it's, um, it's interesting because I don't think you can, I think the people who just automatically discredit someone like Derek Webb or Joshua Harris or whomever deconstructs, I mean, pick your poison. Um, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's, I don't know, a little callous and probably flippant and probably arrogant to, um, to just discredit them out of hand, <laughs> you know, like, why would you, why would you respect them and give them all this credit and like them so much and approve of everything when they affirmed the th this line that you wanted them to affirm. And then all of a sudden overnight, they stop affirming that. And granted, there's other things like with Derek Webb, there's other things going on, but all of a sudden you're just like, nope, it's all like everything that he says is whatever. Right. And so just for people who don't know who Joshua Harris is, who, who is he? And like, what would you say your <sighs> level of like prior to the documentary that he did and all of that stuff, what was your ignorant, like, uh, yeah, what sort of um, experience Harris with him? Was, yeah, he was a, he's probably most well known as being an author. He was a fairly successful author who wrote this book called his big book was I Kiss Dating Goodbye, mm -hmm. um, which had a huge influence on what's called kind of, I would say larger Christian, but mainly evangelical purity culture. Yeah. A lot of people read that book. Um, I read that book. I read, I don't know, I probably read two or three or four of his other books. If he has that many, I'm trying to think. He's, Sex is Not the Problem, Lust is, is another one of his books that I read. Um, is something about like a gospel-centered church. Maybe that's C.J. Mahaney. Anyhow, he's an author. He's um, he's he's a pastor. I mean, is really what he was. So he was kind of Sovereign Grace Ministries was this church that it's now a denomination, but it was a group. It was a family of churches that were were kind of pioneers in this small group church movement. Okay. They kind of trailblazed that whole thing they were like one of the first people to really start small groups um they're they're kind of in the they're weird it's not as strange now but it was at the time when they first started there so they're kind of like in this category of they're reformed in certain aspects of their theology so like calvinist um in some areas but they're not like confessionally reformed so they're not like paul vanderclay they don't come from the reformed tradition but they're reformed in some aspects of their theology, but then they're also like charismatic. And so they're like in the churches, they're like, you know, they're speaking in tongues, prophecy, waving flags. So like, wow. Yeah. They're also Baptists. And so it's a little, and I mean, the expressions of that varied from church to church. There was definitely, I remember going to church with people waving flags and I was just like, and that wasn't my background prior to that. And I was like, I guess whatever floats your boat. Where should Jesus with that flying that flag? I mean, whatever. Um, and so uh, he, C.J. Mahaney. So they're kind of like, if you're familiar with the Gospel Coalition or John Piper, and so they're like, they're kind of adjacent to Tim Keller in a way, but they're not Presbyterian. So like, they travel in similar circles in kind of this broader. Calvinist. It's also confusing. <laughs> American evangelical world. So CJ Mahaney was in that. And CJ Mahaney was the guy who started Sovereign Grace Ministries. And then Joshua Harris was like his, he was like his Timothy to Paul, kind of. He was the guy who took over for him, took over the this mega church in Gaithersburg, Maryland, outside of DC. And it was like, we called it the mothership. 
it was the first Sovereign Grace Church. <laughs> uh, makes it sound less culty when you call it the mothership. Um, <laughs> or more, I'm not sure. Um, uh, so he, author, that, that's a long-winded answer. He's an author pastor. Um, <laughs> yeah. And now he is, now he no longer identifies as Christian, mm -hmm. um, which is really interesting. Actually the best, I don't know if you link this stuff, uh, stuff people reference, but the best interview in relation to that was on Preston Sprinkle. He's a personal friend of mine, um, his podcast where he had Joshua Harris on, where he's talked, he talked about all of that the most in depth um, I've ever heard him talk about it. Yeah. I knew you were going to bring up Preston. <laughs> Boy, does good work. Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks for that background. Um, I think it's helpful, especially for people. Because for me, I, I understand it, but I grew up in even dog culture and I grew up in purity culture. And so I have some sort of, sort of that reference. But for a lot of people, it's like these names, like, you know them if you're in those cultures. But if not, it's like, who the hell is this? Yeah, I kiss dating goodbye, that purity culture stuff. So, like, you know, not kissing girls until you get married. Uh, like that was a big thing because he did that, you know, courting, um, you know, chaperones. Like it's a weird, it created a, it created a culture that even if you're not familiar with that book and or Joshua Harris, like that was a major, that was a major piece of that culture, which affected a lot of people. Right. So yeah, you, you, you talked about something I think important and that resonates with me is this deconstruction and especially deconstruction that leads to a loss of faith. And because um, for me, I think when I talk about deconstruction, I think it's more than just losing faith. It's it's this breaking down and tearing apart of a thing that you used to know and then, you know, reconstructing into something different. Oh, you know, wherever that leads, whether that's faith or not faith. And um, it's been pretty prevalent lately, especially with some bigger figures like Red and Link, uh, Joshua Harris, um, uh, John Steingard, the the lead singer of Hawk Nelson. Mm. You know, it's all these people. Skillet singer, huh? Some little singer of Skillet, like that. That's like a. Oh, nice did he deconstruct too? I think so. Probably. Who knows? Oh, who knows? <laughs> They're all deconstructing. They're all falling apart. And I think what's really interesting to me is how. Um, sort of people's personal experiences can like affect people in the way that they look at information or the way that they look at their life. And just this idea that, you know, someone's behavior or someone's change of belief can shatter the perceptions of our own beliefs in so many ways. And like, I'd love to kind of explore that with you and see, I mean, with, with this one and some of these others, how, how has that affected the way that you're looking at some of these issues? Oh man, so um, lots of thoughts. Paul likes to make fun of me. Lots of thoughts. Um, uh, the, well, the first thing that I think of is like, that's not surprising to me because I actually think that's how belief works. I mean, that's the big Rene Girard idea when he, mimesis or mimetic desire, that's Rene, that's a big capstone kind of center of Rene Girard's whole philosophy and a lot of his work of which I'm a big fan is that all desire is borrowed. And so the reason that any of us want anything is that you, you are borrowing and emulating the desire, the pattern of desire that you see from someone that you love or admire. So mm -hmm. the easiest way to illustrate that would be like, he, he used the illustration, I think this is his, or maybe it's somebody just it, trying to illustrate it, is that like a baby, when they don't want to eat something and you're spoon feeding them, you go, uh, uh, mm, 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 you know, good. Mm, and you show that it's good and then the baby will eat it. Mm -hmm. that's really simple mimetic desire um, but I actually think that's fundamentally how all desire works so I think really I don't know a lot of this is like central to I think what's going on under all this deconstruction and self-identity of faith is that we all think that we believe all these things and we self-identify with our beliefs because we think we have all these ideas that are connected to beliefs but really, I think at a much more fundamental level, it's it's relational and communal. And people that you admire maybe have faith, whether it's your parents or a pastor or an intellectual or a thinker or a musician. And, and you're borrowing their desire because something in them resonates with you and you're borrowing 
their passion. You love the things they love. Um, so it's not surprising to me that when, when someone that you admire then deconstructs and says they're losing faith, I mean, that, that can be really, um, you know, that can be really um, troubling to you because then you start to, <clears throat> I think it goes, it throws you into this liminal place where you're like, well, do I, you have to make a choice then. Well, do I still admire this person? Whatever that was, whatever that longstanding admiration was that drew me to this person, well, do I still have that? Because then I have to respect what they're saying, or I have to make a hard break with it. And why? Right. And you have to, to sort through all that emotionally and psychologically and intellectually. Um, so it's not surprising to me. But then the other thing that I would connect to is like even the Joshua Harris thing. I don't know. So part of my own intellectual journey over the past two years is I just put, I explicitly like to even say now when I talk about anything, whether it's my Christianity or whether it's being an advocate of Christian nonviolence or universalism or whatever, all these other, any identity, any category you can put on your belief. I like to say explicitly, like I self-identify as a Christian or I self-identify as whatever, because and the reason for that is, is a lot of the Jordan Peterson stuff. It's the, it's the act as if belief. So he, when he talked to Sam Harris, that was one of the big takeaways of their agreement, of their conversations is Peterson thinks that belief most fundamentally is how you act. Whereas Sam Harris likes to talk about it in like these affirmations of ideas and self-identity. Mm -hmm which whatever, that's fine. It is what it is. But Peterson says more fundamentally, it's how you act in the world. It's how you manifest these things over time. And I agree with him. So, so how I apply that to somebody like Joshua Harris or anyone who deconstructs or myself for that matter and how I self-identify is that's fine. Like Joshua Harris, you no longer self-identify as a Christian. Cool. I don't really <laughs> care that much. Like uh, yeah. how do you... Like, yeah. I think you largely probably act the same. You maybe stopped going to church. You maybe don't think that you believe all these different abstracted doctrines. But I don't think you probably act that differently. So then, I don't know. I just, I don't. How you self-identify is fine. You know, it's cool. We can talk about that a lot. I just don't. I guess that's how I've shifted a lot is I just don't value it that much in myself and or others necessarily. Yeah. It's interesting. I was thinking about this the other day and, you know, this idea of like belief in what faith is. And, you know, I've sort of been re readjusting my definitions and idea of faith from not just this, this claim of belief, but this act of trust, right? You have faith in something you're, and you're you're having faith in in that religion. So if you're if you're believing in a religion on faith, there is some sort of relationship to the way that you're acting to show that you do have that trust in that thing. Yeah. And we 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 fail in that. But that to me was sort of something that I was thinking about. And so this idea of acting as if versus self identification, I wouldn't go as far to say that self identification doesn't matter. Sure. I th I think it does, and I think it it especially matters like. For, for yourself, but I think it also can be complicated where just because you identify as a Christian, well, what does that mean? And what does the person next to you think that means? And there's all of these baggage in these words. And so how do we, how do we parse apart the idea of what you personally believe about something and, and, and how that manifests in your life and then what it's supposed to mean in the grand scheme of things with a more objective view of that. And it's all a very complicated, I think, equation we're all trying to figure out. Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm trying to fight the urge to take it too esoteric and philosophical, which is always my uh, my go-to. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think so. Maybe I'm learning though. I think a better way to talk about it is that you just. I think, I think all the deepest way that we know anything is, is in our lived reality. So, um, I mean, I call this, like, I've been calling this Eucharistic knowing, like, 
what we know in our communion, what we know in our relationship, what we know in how we act and how that manifests in the world. So <clears throat> what you most know is not just these, these abstracted ideas that are in your head, but it's how you live your life every second of every day. It's what you do with your body. That's what you mm. know most fundamentally. Mm. So, and I just think, I don't know, we, we spend, like even with this Joshua Harris stuff, it's not the Joshua Harris or Derek Webb or anyone and, and people who deconstruct. It's not that those conversations don't need to be had and we can't have them, but then, um, and like you were saying, I think it's valuable and it's maybe even really valuable for you, but then the most important thing is how you act and manifest in the world. So, so like right. with Web, this is what I was saying, or Red and Link. I don't think, I mean, I don't know, like they may be changed this is where it maybe matters. They've maybe changed their rituals and their practices some, like they maybe stopped going to church. They maybe stop reading their Bible, maybe not. They maybe stop, I don't know, doing some of these kinds of practices that Christians do. And over time, I mean, if you change your habits and your rituals, that will change you. You will start to act in the world differently. Um, so maybe that's how it really matters, but um, but then too, at the end of the day, it's kind of like, it's the whole good atheist thing. Like, why does, why are there some atheists, you know, self-identifying atheists who act more like Christians than self-identifying Christians? Right. That's because of all this. Right. Well, and that gets into an interesting side point that I wanted to get to too, or it's like, cause it's not, it's more than just deconstruction, right? So for me, I think I, there's this negative energy within churches, especially in evangelical churches of deconstruction and how do we avoid this and how do we stop people and especially kids and youth from, you know, uh, going away from their faith. And I think that's why Rhett and Link was a huge deal because everybody was like, they're so influential, especially with children. And so that was like this huge thing, but it was like, wait, hold on. If, if a kid, like we, we need to have a little more faith in our our kids than that you know and it's like it's okay for them to have questions it's okay for them and in fact they should they yeah. should you know sometimes you need the little earthquake to get you to realize oh i'm not on solid ground and i want to learn more and you know take this on for myself and that's a really important thing and i think there should be space especially in churches for people to say these doubts and to say exactly what they don't like that they don't believe these things and yeah. not because that's the only way we can really have a conversation instead of just putting on this cloak and pretending, oh, I'm this thing or that other thing. And I mean, I think with, um, I think the biggest change that I've seen in a lot of those people who could deconstruct is sort of the LGBTQ support. You mm. know, when you look at like Rhett and Link or even John Steigard or Josh Har Joshua Harris, that's a big action where that is very different than they would have probably done within the Christian communities, especially like a Joshua Harris, where, and that, and that's one thing that John Steingard had had talked about you know, being, you know, deconstructing coming out. And he's actually one of the most healthy deconstructors that I've seen out on the, you know, in the space. I think a lot of them, you know, they, they were hurt or there was some issue that they had. And then they sort of like kind of chucked everything out and went this other way, but he's very thoughtful in it and is still exploring. And it, it, he's very interesting. But one of the things he said is to be able to openly support the LGBTQ communities in ways he didn't think he could as a Christian has been a huge change for a lot of those people, um, which is interesting. But I think there's one thing from somebody like uh, a Rhett and Link or a Joshua Harris who like, maybe they didn't change that much, but like, you know, that they, they they're, they're still acting as if, I suppose, that there are some of these Christian values and there's a moral compass. But what about these people who act, call themselves Christians, represent as if they're Christians, and then it comes out that they've had some scandal or they've have done something inappropriate, like a Rabbi Zacharias or even you know the, the Derek Webb. How, those things are very different. How do, you, how do you see the distinctions in the way they play out within uh, the the relational dichotomy of like their work and how we see them in culture. Yeah. So, because I was thinking about that earlier too, the the people who stay, because with that act as if versus think or self identify dichotomy, um, there are all those people, right? Like that's those are 
that's exactly what I think of maybe because I was just watching uh, Julian and Esther's conversation where they're talking about all that. Um, because, so I don't know, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a couple things. I mean, it's not as if Christians are sinless or faultless, but, but the problem is, and Esther, I think, said this really well in that conversation. I haven't finished it, but she was saying, you know, what is scary about particularly Ravi Zacharias or I can't think of any other examples, but there were a couple, him in particular, who these things were like, he never confessed this. Like this all came out after he died. Like this was just an area right. of repentance, manipulative sin. So it's not, it's not as if Christians are faultless or perfect or whatever, but but he had this double identity and this hidden manipulative kind of veiled thing that really right. raised some stuff into question whether or not he was acting as if a Christian. Like you were curating this big outside persona, but then what's going on with that? So that's something I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't think you or I would say like it's our place to judge those people, particularly outside of a, knowing them personally in the christian context i would say it doesn't look good um you know yeah. i'm not gonna say they're not a christian or something you know i don't know that's that's uh between them and god i guess um i would say it's you know it doesn't look great to <laughs> to, yeah. say, to be that much of a hypocrite and to have that all hidden um i think yeah. that that is almost more destructive in like the getting clarity of ideas and what religions are and what belief is yeah. and faith than for someone who says, oh, I'm just going to deconstruct because it's like you're claiming this thing and it's not matching the way that you say you want to live or should live. And yes, you can say that there's sin. And I, I don't know. I, I was never a big fan of Rabbi Zacharias necessarily. So I don't know much of his work and I, I'm not here to claim anybody's belief I don't know but it is interesting to sort of see that and it becomes to it starts to feel like oh it's just all snake oil juice they're charlatans and you know it makes you know especially if you do have a passion to protect the vulnerable it can make you want nothing to do with it yeah absolutely um and I get that you know I mean I fully the kind of people who are atheists who criticize the church and Christianity or religion. I mean, yep, I'm, I'm right there with them with all that. That is how it looks. And it's, and I would agree with you, like that is more damaging to the church than, than the kind of deconstruction thing. And I think Paul handles this really well. Cause you, you made this point earlier and I, and I very much agree with it, that it is not, it's kind of like, if you have doubts and if you are one, I mean, I mean, this could get really personal because it's, which is fine. I mean, that's, that was the same story with me because I, because I deconstructed, like I, I, in a sense, like, but this is, I'm unique in that, like, I never, I never once had a crisis of faith where my faith was in doubt, but I definitely reevaluated and checked through a lot of different doctrines mm. that I, um, that I questioned and doubted and things and went through that. It's just, I never had, <clears throat> I think that I'm different than somewhat a lot of people where like Rhett and Link, I can listen to a lot of the things that they talk about or Joshua Harris. Um, and I can listen to them talk about their deconstruction and all the different things that they went through and think, and I maybe can't relate to everything personally, you know, like I didn't have an affair or something, but <laughs> yet that's known. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um you heard it here first <laughs> i can't relate to that but i can relate to a lot of their thinking and processing and i'm just like i don't understand why that makes you lose faith like i just have never i never correlated those things and i really agree that if the church or the authority or parents or pastors are that's what i was thinking when you were talking about it, are trying to like repress that and suppress that and say sweep it under the rug Keep it underground. Just don't talk about it. Just keep that in your union subconscious. Uh, that's going to come back to bite you. Like yeah. that's, that's going to come out. Like you're just lying. Yeah. You're just lying to yourself. So what good does that do? Well, with the Joshua Harris thing, it was so interesting because he comes out with this documentary, right? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like saying that he's 
denouncing the teachings that he had before, but he doesn't say he's not a Christian. There's no sign that he's getting divorced. It's out for like three months. And then all of a sudden I'm not a Christian. I'm getting divorced, all of this stuff. And it's like, Whoa. so there was still this sort of pressure to put up this like veil, even though he's stepping out and saying something different. And I appreciated, I, so I didn't ever read Joshua Harris, Harris's book, but I'd heard of the book and like, I grew up in purity culture. So I knew all of that, the courting stuff and the dating stuff. And so it wasn't unfamiliar to me and watching that documentary was really interesting because it made me realize, oh, wow, that stuff probably affected me more than I thought in a negative way. And not that I don't think that the values that he was teaching were necessarily bad. Like I think for myself, I hold to a lot of those things personally, but I, I'm with them in the, the way that it's done is it probably needs to be changed. And it seems like there's this throwing out the baby with the bathwater that is creating maybe a negative cycle in the way that we're processing, you know, how, how to handle these issues. Um, yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, I don't, well, and I think you can, there, there's just all, you can err in so many ways, right? I mean, you can err on this side really easy and you can err on this side and there's such a tendency to swing yeah. a pendulum. If you see a big air this way, swing the pendulum back this way in a really extreme way. Cause that's, I don't know that, that <clears throat> speaking of Joshua Harris, that was a lot of the criticism. Like you'd hear all this criticism of the documentary. So I watched it and loved it. I mean, you can so easy to criticize things that you sure. can say. Cause I heard people saying like, I don't accept your apology because that's basically what it was. It was just, the whole documentary was like him going around, listening to people's stories, hearing it, receiving it, not being defensive, just taking it and then apologizing for what, how it had adversely affected them in their life. A pretty Christian thing to do, I would think. And then I heard all this criticism on the one hand that was just like, I don't accept his apology. Like what he did was so wrong. You know, like I refuse to accept it, but this like hyper, victim culture like we there can be no forgiveness mm -hmm. cross this line you know like we, no grace no no forgiveness and there's people on this other side that are just like oh he's groveling and he's just like you know fuck up take some responsibility like yeah you read a book like he because you read a book it ruined your life you know like take some responsibility yeah and i can and there's merit to both of those i think you yeah know? Um, you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I just, I saw what he was doing in the documentary and I loved it. You know, it's a, <clears throat> there's something about it. Maybe it's the increased, it's like the brothers Karamazov orthodoxy thing where it's just, even if you cannot, that's one of the most beautiful things in that book that I loved about um, like the elder Zosima or something is like, even though he's in situations where you're like, this guy has done nothing wrong. And this family, this train wreck of a family has come in and they're just like airing all their dirty laundry of like their life that's just a, a wreck. But yet the elder just like gets on his face and bows his head to the ground and begs forgiveness of them for how he's failed them. Just kind of as a spiritual leader in the community or something. And you're like, that doesn't even make sense. So like there's an aspect of that with Joshua Harris that I love, you know, just fully accepting blame, even if a bit, even if a lot of the blame was maybe overkill in my opinion, I still think yeah. that's, um, but yeah, I that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, and he said this, like, it doesn't mean that everything in the book is garbage or that right. he wasn't really well-intended when he right. wrote it. You know. Right. Well, that's what I, exactly what I was just going to say. I think he had the best intentions of those things. And, you know, I mean, he lived it out himself. Yeah. Um, so that for me, some of that stuff is like, oh, you know, and like, um, I actually just listened to a podcast with Julie Slattery on Preston's podcast. And she talked about the purity culture in a way that I thought was really interesting and sort of addressed some of the problems that uh, that are happening with with some of those things. So you should check that out. But like, I think with her, she was sort of saying there was these things that were really well intended that ended up manifesting themselves in like negative ways. And instead of just trying to explain to people what sex is and 
you know, what the, what the sacredness of it is and like how it fits in a biblical narrative, we told people not to do it and gave them like, you know, doctrines or ways to help prevent that. And like, when you read the book and you think about those doctrines, there's a lot of wisdom in a lot of those things. But then if it's just attached to the action without any meaning, it's really hard for you to like get a depth of it. And then it, it does become something oppressive. And so it's, it's sort of this mixed bag where it's like, well, some of, okay, yes, I think we should be careful about what we teach and what we proclaim as like, you know, something that should be followed by all. But I think there's also some responsibility as consumers to be discerning and to be able to, you know, think about what we're consuming and not take it as gospel truth and right. try to process that and take some responsibility on ourselves in the way that we're processing that and reevaluating those things. Right. And that's probably the bigger, <clears throat> yeah, like we were saying, there's truth on both sides of those, but that's probably my bigger critique of the culture isn't so much is that is is not so much that they that they put out a book and promulgated something like purity culture and I kiss dating goodbye and all that, which is fine in and of itself, but that the but that the same culture in which that whole purity culture thing happened doesn't promulgate discernment and wisdom. It just it somewhat, even though they wouldn't profess this, they wouldn't tell you this in the Sunday school answer that they that they don't advocate for discernment but they basically just teach you like rules you know follow these rules which interestingly when you were talking it reminded me of this which is one of my favorite Derek Webb songs which is which he wrote I don't know it was probably in his well this is his third solo album but um, Mockingbird but he has a song called A New Law which is that he's just like don't teach me about politics and government just tell me who to vote for don't teach me about truth and beauty just label my music. Don't teach me how to live like a free man. Just give me a new law. I don't want to know if the answers aren't easy. So just bring it down from the mountain to me. Mm -hmm. Like it's just that song is like, I've gone back to that song so much. It's like a, it's almost equivalent to a Bible verse for me. And I, and it's, uh, and like, that's the thing that's so crazy. So like Derek Webb wrote that song probably I don't know, 20 years ago. Hmm. He's the same guy that wrote that song, which is profoundly true and brilliant and right on, right on. And now he's this guy who had an affair, deconstructed, no longer self-identifies as a Christian. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. It is. I And I think that point's really valid too. I think that for myself in that, in my deconstruction, that was my big critique about the, um, sort of the culture in which church manifests itself in Western societies, where it's like, we're told what to believe, but not why. And we're not taught how to even find the why ourselves. We're just, here's this thing, consume it, package it, and live it. And you're like, wait, okay, no, no. <laughs> questions are scary. And if, yeah. you listen to Rhett and Link's, if you listen to Rhett and Link's things in a non-critical way, like where they talk about their deconstruction, that's exactly what they said. Yeah, they, we had all these thoughts, but we didn't. We knew nobody wanted to hear them. Yeah. So they didn't want to process them in church. We knew that the church wasn't going to want to hear anything we said. So we did it by ourselves, and then we ended up going through this whole process by ourselves, and then we just left. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing too. I think a big reason they got so much play is because they left. And, I, you know, I think that there is something to the fact that, like, the church needs to be more amenable to people who are questioning and deconstructing because um, they are going to just do it on their own. I did it on my own, you know, and it's not it's not the best way to do it. It's better if you're walking through someone with someone or in community and having space to work out these ideas and struggle with them to try to do it on your own. You're just going to drive yourself crazy. Yeah. But there's so many stories that are probably, you know, people go through deconstruction and they stay in faith, but they probably have a new view of it or like, you know, a different, a different worldview. And those stories don't get as much play because it's not a shocking of like, oh, they've rejected this thing that they stood for for so long. Yeah. And it's, uh, so it's, so it's interesting. I'm always wondering too, how much of 
how much of deconstruction really ends in a loss of faith or is that how we feel because that's the stories we're given well or yeah yeah that's that's the narrative you're given is that if you deconstruct and if you change your beliefs about certain doctrines then you're outside the camp because that's the that's the frame of that kind of church ethos is that they have this paul was talking about this recently and i brought it up in the in like the open studio one day but that's i don't know if you ever heard about bounded set versus center set like doctrine it's basically the idea within a church that like is your doctrine such that like there's a center and core which as a mystic i would say is this mystical christ which is <laughs> really hard to pin down but even if it's not that even if it's propositional this propositional core they the center set is the idea that this is in the middle and there's just this periphery around it that mm -hmm where there's not really boundaries. It's just kind of, we're all kind of circling this thing. Yeah. But I would say the point is mystery, like an ineffable mystery that is utterly transcendent, uh, but also manifested in the particular Trinitarian. Um, <laughs> but, um, but then there's the idea of bounded set, which is like, there's a center where we're all in and then there's a hard line. This yeah. is kind of like Paul's, remember his hard line, grime line thing? He was talking about McConaughey. Uh, whatever <laughs> too much content i know so that it's that kind of idea though i would say, and this is so to get into meister i don't know if you've heard this and i'll be brief because i know we're running up on time but um so in rent and link's defense when i was deconstructing i did it in church i explicitly did it in church i explicitly told the pastors everything that was going on when i i started my deconstruction when I lived in Washington, uh, I, I watched a YouTube video about hell and I was just like, and it threw me into a, just this weird loop where I was just like, what's going on? I don't have a clue what's going on with this whole hell idea. Yeah. I started looking into it, but then we moved. And while we were moving, I was looking into churches where I wanted to go, like I always did, doing my groundwork. I contact the pastor who I knew previously. It was like, listen, this is where I'm at. I'm going through this. I'm questioning these things. I want to do this in community. I don't want to do it on my own. He was okay with it. But here's the thing. He wasn't really okay with it. He was, this is like Sam, when Sam and um, Jeff and I spoke about the Red and Link thing and Randos, I said this explicitly, and this is true. Like they're, they're okay with it in theory, as long as you eventually get in line and believe the right thing, which is mm -hmm. what they think. Yeah. But that never happened with me because I just don't think it's right. And I actually right. don't think it's biblical. And I wanted to have those continuing conversations with them, but I came to the point where I was like, they're not moving ever. Right. And, and I just really don't see it that way. And I think they're wrong and they won't even engage the conversation with me. And so I was just like, so then, so then what do you do? You, you can't actually do it in community. And then the past, uh, there's a lot of, the brief version is that there was essentially like a, um, I was meeting with this guy that I was having, this lay guy that I was having conversations with. You know, if two people can't come to an agreement, you should invite a third, Matthew 18, this is how you deal with conflict. I invited an associate pastor to my house to talk about this. When I opened the door, oh, head pastor is also there surprise they came in it was like it was like a intercession um like you could tell conversations were happening behind the scenes there was like yeah it felt gross it was the, it's the worst church experience i've ever had and um and i was like i'm a fairly volatile emotional person like i got pissed off and i don't like i don't because <laughs> essentially the pastor without going into it like he essentially called me a liar and i was just like excuse me and i was mad and i was looking around at everybody else and i was just like the guy that i was the friend with who told me he wasn't really my friend he was just taking up my bandwidth so i wouldn't talk to anyone else which really hurt yeah and then the other pastor who i trusted too was sitting there and i was just like he just called me a liar and he's really out of bounds here and you guys are just saying nothing yeah. i was i was fired up and i like i was almost i was like one of those things where I was like almost crying, but also just like wanting to like rage hit a punching bag. Like I was so upset. <laughs> and I called my wife up and I was just like, I have to get a witness here who's on my side, who I feel like cares about the truth, who yeah. isn't just playing some ridiculous game. Um, 
so whatever, all this happened. And um, well, and that's all I'll say about it. Cause I don't, I wanna like get too, I've been, I don't know. I don't yeah. wanna just do it, but um, cause it, whatever, this would be public. But I was very upset and, and here's the thing, like I tried to do everything above board. Yeah. It went really shitty. Um, I don't think Rhett and Link are wrong to not want to talk about it because I think they intuitively know and not just on baseless nothing, it's not going to go well. Yeah. And I, I think that's true. And I think it depends on the church too, because there's definitely like, look, Paul sits and talks to Randos every day Paul's and he's, he's an exception. I do think he's an exception, but it, you know, it depends on the church and like, when I ended evangelicalism, um, the church that I went to was very lovely um, and the people were great, but there was this sort of like, you know, we are going to stick to this program. We're going to tell the truth. And like, you know, that's just, that's going to win, but it's like, but, and I would say this because I went on like evangelical missions with them and, you know, not because I necessarily was like fired up and believed in it. I was actually pretty skeptical of them and I wanted to like test myself and grow. And so we're doing these evangelical missions. We're going on campuses, asking people questions. And the question I always had for them, it's like, okay, we're two missionaries here. Let's say we run into two Mormon missionaries. We're sitting across the table we want to tell them our truth and they want to tell us their truth yeah how do we figure out what's more true than the other and like it's this it's this thing where it's like at some point you've got to let people explore these things and like ask the questions and get to the understanding of why without this agenda of like oh we're trying to save you and like i don't huh we can't i can't hear you oh. Feminine spaces. Oh, feminine spaces. <laughs> yeah. So the whispering wasn't picking up, but um, yeah, like I think there was just this this thing in me where it's like, I think it's fine. I don't even think it's wrong that you want to share this with other people because if it changed your life, you believe that it could probably change other people's lives and you want to see them do that. That's great. It doesn't, that's fine. And it wasn't like they were necessarily pushy or like made you feel bad if you didn't believe that but I think there was the sense of like it was make a lot of friends to bring them to church and then they'll get saved and then it to me it was like shouldn't shouldn't it just be like let's talk to a lot of people make a lot of friends because they're people and we should love them independent yeah. of whether they change or not and then like right. live your life and maybe someone will see something different in you that they want like you know I couldn't agree more so yeah so a quick I want to add this because people see me as this person who just hates evangelicalism. It's not true. My, the last <laughs> evangelical church that I was a part of was great. Uh, I love the pastor. I'm still friends with a lot of the people there, local in Minneapolis here. And um, uh, it just got to the point where we were just kind of seeing the world in different ways. And yeah. I, um, and I just couldn't, we just couldn't communicate anymore. And it was, I don't know, part of it was just me, you know, just my own emotions and, and my wife, because it was just driving me crazy. And my wife was just like, I can't have you. <laughs> all the time. So if it's going to yeah. bleed over and just affect our entire life and family, we got to do something. So that's one thing. But then also to what you were saying is, is just having the conversation and just letting people figure it out. And, and David Dark has this great line. I thought of when you said this, he's an author, he says, what a Christian is, is just somebody who's supposed to bear testimony to the testimony they perceive. Just, just te say it like you see it. Yeah. I think that's what we're supposed to do. And I think that's what, it's so funny because Paul recently, in one of his things, he was talking to the Wisdom Collective guy, who I don't know who that was, but uh, he was talking about when all this started and he kept getting all this attention and everything was growing, he kept telling, think about this for a while. He kept telling all the local pastors and people he knew, like, this is something you need to pay attention to. Like, this thing is happening that I don't really understand, but it's drawing a lot of attention. All these people are coming together and talking about religion. This is what we always wanted. Yeah. Pay attention to this. What is this? Right. How many people are outside of Paul? How much did that affect the people that he told? It didn't. 
did it. I mean, it had, like other pastors didn't just start doing that that I know of. Pastors aren't doing that. They're yeah. just, they're, how many pastors are skeptical of Jordan Peterson? What is that? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, I, I also want to say I have nothing against evangelicals. I try to be very cautious because I, I think there are times I say a lot of critical things about it. In some ways, I still kind of feel attached to it. Like it's so much of like, there's always going to be a little bit of an evangelical in me because that's how I grew up and how I was wired and I lived it so long. And I, I have so much appreciation and respect for the things that it gave me. 100%. But um, yeah, I, I kind of got to that point too. And I, I actually, last Sunday, I went to an evangelical Protestant church with my roommate and I left that church going, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm not Protestant anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you're like oh yeah yeah like I already had that feeling but I it, like it felt confirmed there was there were certain things just about it that like even just some of the the doctrine and the teaching that I was like wait 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 hold on I, I've heard this a long time but I don't think that's right you know and it's so it's the shifting and this changing and sure. there was something when I was in evangelical churches that wasn't that they were against questioning necessarily but even when it was like, we should find a way to like, for people who do have these questions to reach out where it's not just like, a, oh, come here, let me tell you the truth. Like we can have genuine discussions with that. And they're like, yeah, that's a great idea. But like, we don't want to muddy the truth. And it's like, well, if the truth is the truth. It'll stand outside the mud. Huh? I mean, what's implied in that is like, we don't want to muddy the truth, which we see and know. Yeah. And, and they don't. So like that, that kind of comes into this like smuggled assumption within it that, you know, I, we talked about in that first red link video, Rando's video is that it's like, we're okay with questioning as long as they eventually come over here to team truth yeah. to us, to our side of the line. As long as they're receptive. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's, and that's the, the problem with that is that that's a fundamentally, this is where I'll, I love it. Tyler Anderson said this. That's fundamentally a masculine space. It's not a feminine space and it will never allow for openness and genuine expression. Like this is why, this is why I love psychoanalysis so much is that's what a good psychoanalyst does is they, they sit there with you in a room in, in a space of complete non-judgment and let you talk. Yeah. And then eventually you, you say things that you don't even know that, you know, because we all know so much more than we know. And eventually you, you can talk yourself and, and tell yourself the truth. And you start to discern those things because you're in a space that allows you to even say it. You can bring it into the light. That's what church should be, but it's not a lot. I think, I think it's hard because there's so many people who speak confidently about things that maybe we should be less confident about. And that's contagious. Yeah. And, it, it, it's it's that's one level of like we have all these things that we speak with authority and then all of a sudden when you really start to dig and think about it you kind of start to wonder uh, how strongly do, do we know that and should we speak about that but then there's this other side of like the spirit in which it's engaged mm -hmm. where it's like winning and losing versus like hey we're all on a journey and we're all experiencing these things and how do we how do we come together to like make sense of it all is that even i mean that sounds so like i still have the i still have the conservative evangelical fundy leaning elephant in me like when you said that <laughs> like we're all on a journey and we're learning and meet like i know i know how they hear that i know immediately <laughs> how that's heard they're just like oh truth doesn't matter it's just fuzzy postmodern relativism well and that's not what i mean at all i think truth truth fundamentally matters but sure. and, and i i am going to do a video about this i i have to like figure out exactly what I want to say but like there's this there's this idea of like yes there is something ultimately true mm. and we should acknowledge that but we also need to acknowledge that what we've personally experienced and what we've personally picked up and gone through has meaning and value and helps us get closer to this thing that's ultimately true yeah. and so how do we make that balance of like not not because I'm definitely not a subjectivist I don't think that there's not you know objective truths in the world maybe some things are more objective than others but like there needs to be some middle ground and i need to be willing to be i can be confident in my beliefs but i have to be at least somewhat willing to be proven wrong or i'm doing everybody in the conversation a disservice yeah you have to actually be 
talking to other people like I've where you're where that potential is there like I've often thought that sometimes in conversations I want to just stop everyone and just be like okay is anyone here open to the possibility of seeing anything in any differently than they yeah. came in the conversation with because if not I'll just stop talking like I have zero right well and it's it's not to say that I'm above that. I think there was plenty of times, especially as I started my deconstruction and th through all of it, where I wasn't actually, I was open. I'm open person, but I'm also not very agreeable. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just gonna placate to something because, you know, um, you know, I should or whatever. And I think that can do me a service, but it all can also can just be a disservice to me taken to its extreme where it's like, I feel confident, I know, I've got the answers. And then all of a sudden it's like, it took me, you know, <laughs> it took me really breaking down to get to the place to really be in a conversation and be willing to say, oh, maybe, maybe I need to think more about this. And I, I mean, I still struggle with it. I think that's my biggest problem. I've definitely got some pride in me. And, you know, I like the black and white answers. I like the certainty. And um, I think part of like my negative consumption habits were, were built out of that to be certain, to get that foundation and to like have all the answers so I could have the quick answers. But as I've gone out and has, as I've engaged with people, I've realized, listen, this winning and losing mentality and the certainty, like that's ridiculous. The only people I need to convince is myself and I need to convince myself to the truth and not what I want to be true. And yeah. that's serviced me way better than, you know, some of the spirit of like, we gotta tell everybody else the truth. We gotta convince people. We gotta win people to the right side. Yeah. And it's well, I mean, yeah. And even that's, you know, well intended. That's a part of it. Yeah, it's, it totally um, is. It's a uh, judging actually my last evangelical pastor he's the one who said this and i love it i bring it up all the time but he told me once he said i learned a long time ago to stop judging people's intentions because it's just a complete waste of time yeah like it doesn't matter it's irrelevant you know i mean you can number one you don't know you know i mean we don't even know our own intentions let alone other people's and then say you did like whatever the road to, i love it i quote it all the time the road to hell is paved with good intentions so even even if you're well intended it doesn't matter yeah who cares? Let's just stop talking about people's intentions. Well, right. And I think, and I was saying this to Shane the other day, for me, life is just easier if I give people the best intentions and put that on them and, and live as though it, it's something else than just expecting everybody, you know, to do bad against me. Like, yeah. even if they are, like, to me, it's just better to give them as much grace as I can and then disengage when I can Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. I, I thought this was really fun. <laughs> thanks yeah. for uh, thanks for talking with me, Luke. Yeah, absolutely. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. I know me and Luke referred to a lot of external sources, so if you're interested in checking any of those out, I put something in the link below. Otherwise, that's all I have for you. So as always, I will close with the Serenity Prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. 